Welcome to REA Doctors Podcast, where we aim to inspire doctors to get into real estate investing. In each episode, we'll be speaking with some of the top doctors in this field, sharing their stories, strategies, and lessons learned. Whether you're just starting out in real estate or you're looking to take your portfolio to the next level, we have got you covered. Hello, everyone. Today, I'm very pleased to have Dr. Rani Shalav on REA Doctors Podcast. She's a board-certified emergency physician, real estate investor, and entrepreneur. She's the co-founder of Shalvin Properties and has built a real estate portfolio of over 5,100 units with $184 million in assets under management. She has been featured in Business Insider, Market Watch, The American Reporter, and multiple podcasts. Dr. Shalav's mission is to help other professionals build and protect their wealth so they can reclaim their lives and freedom. Rani, thank you so much for coming on our podcast. Thank you so much for having me. This is a really great podcast and it's very educational and I'm an honored to be here. Great. So we are talking before we started. It's an interesting journey. You're an emergency medicine physician. So how did you end up in real estate from your journey as a doctor towards real estate? We'll be interested to know that. Yeah. So I was practicing 16 years total in emergency medicine. I am no longer practicing, but really two years into being an attending, I started feeling like, oh my gosh, you know, (laughs) how am I going to do this for 30 years? And I started looking around, like, what can I do? And honestly, like in those early years, I felt like there was no hope. There is nothing else you can do. You spent, you know, 20 years studying to be a doctor and you need to continue doing that. And during my journey, my goal is to just put my head down and just stay in medicine, make the best of it. But really, (laughs) I remember a day in one of my shifts, it was 10 o'clock at night, and I was the only doctor and the waiting room was packed. Every single room was full. People were in the hallways. I was taking care of two stroke patients at the exact same time, trying to decide who's going to go to CT first, who is, you know, more critical, am I? and asthmatic and respiratory distress, getting ready to set up to intubate. And my tech hands me another EKG. I look at it, it's another STEMI Mm -hmm. at the same time. And at that time, I just kind of looked up at the clock. (laughs) Like, (laughs) when is someone going to come and rescue me here? Mm -hmm. Uh, Eight more hours. So it was like, I just had to go into survival mode and just not even consider anything else. Just boom, boom, boom. You know, as physicians were trained to be robots, right? Just to, you get into the mode, you stop thinking, you just start instinctually taking care of and doing what you've been trained to do. And really, you know, that's what I did. I didn't sit, I didn't eat, I didn't drink, I didn't pee. (laughs) <laughs> that shift, I came home, kind of shell shock, still in my scrubs, collapsed on the bed, fell asleep. My kids came and were like, let's go to the park. Let's go to, you know, I felt like a bus had hit me. And I said to myself, like, is this it? <laughs> this is me making it. Like I'm a board certified physician, you know, I'm head of this committee, head of this committee, and it, this is my life. And really the administrators are the ones that created that situation. You know, they are the ones that cut our hours. They wanted to save money. So they said, oh, you don't need, you know, another doctor and you don't need a PA. Slowly it was, you don't need a scribe. You don't need a helper. You know, you can just do it. And I was really at the whim of the administrators and I felt powerless. I felt exhausted. I felt drained. And that's when I was like, I have, I have to have a solution. And that's when I started looking at other opportunities. And really at that time, we had a friend that came to us and told us that he invests in 7-Elevens and he owns a piece <laughs> of a hundred 7-Elevens. Oh, wow. He doesn't do anything. <laughs> <laughs> he said he gets passive income. And at that time I was like, this is before everybody was talking about passive income. And I said, passive income, that's fake real Mm -hmm. there's no such thing and my husband's like i mean we should try it and you know i was very cautious i always felt like people are trying to just take advantage of you oh you're a doctor you have a lot of money but at that point i was looking for a solution i was at my wits end and that's when i said why not let's try it we dipped our toe into syndications these were triple net leases Mm -hmm. 
And uh, we got our money pretty quickly because they refinanced at that time. So within, you know, four weeks after close, they refinanced and they gave us back our capital, our initial capital. Mm -hmm. And I was like, whoa, wait, what just happened? Like, I didn't understand. (laughs) (laughs) It's like, wait, wait, so do we still own the building? Mm-hmm. And, um, they were like, oh yeah, you still own it. You're still going to get distributions. You still have ownership, but you know, here's your money back. And I'm like, oh my God. So this is infinite returns. This is risk-free. Whoa. <laughs> and that's when we started looking into all kinds of different commercial asset classes. And we started investing in retail centers, industrial warehouse, self-storage. We did assisted living, RV parks, mobile home parks. We started investing in apartments. We're like, well, we love apartments. We love the idea of it. We love how it's recession resistant. And we started saying that now we've been doing it so much and we've proven out the model, it's not fake. And now Mm -hmm. I can bring in my parents, my friends, my other physician friends that are burnt out and tired. And uh, really that's how we started our company. And I was able to leave medicine. That's really, really great. That's a great story. So during this journey, do you ever own your own rental properties or straight away you were in 7-Eleven and syndications? Do you actually directly own your own properties? Yes, we actually started in syndications. Mm -hmm. And then as we grew our portfolio as limited partners, then we said, okay, let's buy, you know, small multifamily. So we bought three duplexes and they were cash flowing. And then Mm -hmm. we refinanced them, got all our money back out. And we said, okay, this is amazing. (laughs) (laughs) And we invested those money back into something else. And we said, okay, now we need to 10 X this. And that's where I went from doing duplexes, which are two doors Mm -hmm. to the next apartment complex was 200 doors. Oh, wow. And do you actively manage these apartments yourself, buy them yourself? Yeah. So my husband and I are asset managers on three of the seven properties that we have. We're Mm -hmm. on all the general partnership meetings and asset management calls, but we are lead sponsors on three projects. That's great. And where do you invest? Which part of the country? And what is your investment philosophy? Like what is your criteria for selecting properties? Yeah. Thank you for asking that. So we are in multiple states. We're actually excited. Expanding. We are in Fort Worth, in Dallas, in Houston, in Las Vegas. We have properties in Wichita, Kansas, and we're constantly looking for opportunities in the Sun Belt states. We are doing value add class B properties. At some point, we were doing B and C, and I just don't want the headache of C's. <laughs> I know so- exactly what you mean. <laughs> But recently, my husband and I are rebranding, and not only are we expanding into other markets, we're also expanding into other alternative investing assets Mm -hmm. and asset classes. So we have shifted a lot of our portfolio into oil and gas because there's such significant tax benefits. You know, initially, when I was bringing all these deals to my physician friends, they were like, this is... Great tax benefits, but only if you're a real estate professional. What happens when I'm a W-2 job and I don't have that ability to take that depreciation? So we started looking around and around two and a half years ago, we started really investing in oil and gas. Personally, um, we bought our own oil wells. We bought royalties. We've invested into funds of different operators. And we said, you know what? This is giving us the opportunity to take the advantage of the tax benefits against ordinary income, which is huge because that's what my investors were asking for. So now we've really expanded into not only different commercial asset classes, not just apartments. We're going to be doing self-storage, boat storage, garages. We're going to be doing a lot of different things. We're really excited Mm -hmm. about what's coming up. And we're also expanding into oil and gas. So really exciting stuff on the horizon. So for those listeners who don't know what oil and gas investment looks like, can you walk through step-by-step as a LP investor? So what exactly are you investing in and what happens? How are you getting this tax benefits, especially for a W-10 employee, right? A lot of physicians are W-10 employees. And one of the frustrations is, hey, government taxes me the most. And I, there is no break for me, right? After a certain income level, to lose all your tax breaks and stuff. So how does oil and gas investment help with that? Yeah, so there's a lot of different ways that you can get tax advantages. And if you subscribe to my newsletter, I go into a lot of depth. So if you want to check out my website and subscribe, I go into that in significant 
detail. And I can offer a free digital book called The Upside of Oil and Gas Investing for any of the viewers that are interested in that. But the biggest thing that is a benefit is something called intangible drilling costs. Intangible drilling costs are the costs that really cost the operator in terms of chemicals, mud drilling, employees, expenses, any kind of cost or expense that takes to develop and find the oil in the ground. So if the operator's fracking or if the operator has like a big payroll, all of that cost is an ordinary loss and that can go against your ordinary income. Now you have to be careful when you're investing with different operators, you have to really ask, you know, how are the tax benefits? Am I gonna get intangible drilling um, benefits, or if it's royalties, you don't get any, you just get depletion, which is a different type of tax benefit. And that's related to the depletion of the natural resource. The government gives you a tax benefit for that. So when you are looking for opportunities, these are questions that you really want to ask and whatever they tell you, bring it to your accountant and say, okay, if I invested at a hundred thousand dollars into this deal, what would this do to my taxes next year? And a lot of times they can look at it and give you an estimate, which is huge because it's really all about planning for next year, P tax planning. I'm really big into that and in thinking about strategy, how you can lower your tax burden, because it's not only in what you invest, but it's how you invest, which entities are you using? What are you looking for with each investment? So it's being very strategic and it's important to understand what you need. But of course, I don't know a lot about oil and gas investing myself, but what are the risks? Because in general, people say, hey, oil and gas is high risk. So what are the risks and how do you mitigate the risk in your own investments? Yeah, I mean, as with any investment, you can lose your investment flat out. Like if you're investing, there's no such thing as risk-free. How do you mitigate it? Well, I'll give you an example. When I lost $25,000, I invested in an oil exploration deal and it would have been very, very lucrative if they were able to be successful. They told me they had the best geologists, they had the best this, the best that. And I was like, okay. <laughs> so they went in and they drilled and they were able to get to the oil, but the ground was too hard is what I was told. Mm -hmm. um, and they weren't planning on, it was too far deep into the earth and they weren't going to frack it. And that's it. They were like, okay, you lost all your money. And I was like, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that I'm never doing that again. Mm -hmm. We're never invest. That's when I was like, okay, we need, forget that. I don't understand this. Like I'm not doing that again. And every time my husband was like, Hey, what about this deal? I said, no, we're just doing real estate. It's the safest. Mm -hmm. But then I started learning a lot about different types of investments and that you can buy mineral, like mineral rights. You can buy royalties, mineral rights. You can buy into a company that's drilling. You can do a lot of different things and it's not just like one well. Right. Mm -hmm. So how do you mitigate risk? You know, I have an opportunity right now where we've mitigated the risk because it's a well-known sponsor with a large operation. And it's not just them looking in one area. And if it, they don't find that they're done, they're actually going to three different areas. You know, they've identified like three different states, different basins. There's five basins of focus. So it's not just one. And there's other oil production in the same field, right? So I'm looking for multiple states. I'm looking for multiple wells. I'm looking for multiple basins of focus. I'm looking for already oil producing and the experience. And a lot of it is how the deal is structured and what's the track record. Again, anytime you want to invest, you want to find out what the track record of the sponsor is or the so team. The oil prices go up and down, right? Normally based on geopolitical events. So is, is your return is going to be based on the price of oil? How does it tide? Yes. How exactly they're making money, like pumping oil and selling it? Or Yes, literally, that's exactly what it is. And that's why it's a commodity. So mm -hmm. uh, there's always going to be fluctuation. So when you're looking at these type of returns they're going to give you a very wide range. And that's because, well, what if it's based on the number of today's oil prices and what they've been historically, and then they choose the range. Now, any kind of commodity, right, is limited. <laughs> so when you are running out of a commodity, what happens 
to the price. It's always going to go up. So to me, any kind of dip in price, it's cyclical. It's going to be temporary. I'm not saying it's just going to go up all the way all the time, but knowing the economics of supply demand, knowing what's going on in the world and that the demand for, you know, oil and gas, it, it's just not going away. It's what, just getting stronger. And what kind of duration of whole period are you looking at these oil and gas investments typically? Yeah. So again, like I said, every investment different. We bought royalties into an oil producing oil well, mm -hmm. and that's for the rest of our life. Or oh, as long as it drills, as a, <laughs> a, you know, if it, it might go dry tomorrow, right? Mm -hmm. But it, probably not. But when the oil, it can be generational. So my kids can have it. So that is just a cash flow play. I'm just getting checks. That's total. I'm not doing anything. I'm getting cash flow. The oil well that I have as well that I purchased, we bought like a portfolio portfolio of small oil wells. And how long is that? That's again, until I choose to sell it. In the funds that I'm currently raising for, these are structured kind of like a syndication. Mm -hmm. So it's a three to five year hold. Really, it is a play of buying the land, developing it, starting a bunch of wells and then selling it. It's very much like a syndication, like a real estate syndication. So a lot of the investors are interested because it's more familiar to them, right? It's like, oh, okay, it's a fund of land with oil on top of it. And not only is it oil and gas, but it's also the natural gas that they're selling. Mm -hmm. So again, the more diversified you have, the more stable and the more risk mitigation that you can attain. So you also mentioned that you currently have a deal or a property you guys are buying. So can you give us where is this located? Can you give any details about this specific deal you have? For the oil and gas? Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah. So it's a fund and it is with an experienced operator out of Dallas and they are developing the land. And it's going to be in Texas, Wyoming. They're looking at other states and they're going to be purchasing the land to develop it and to drill, to look, to really get the oil in production. And if anyone is interested in hearing about that, I'll be happy to connect and provide more information. I'll put your contact information in the show notes so people can connect with you if they want to. Yeah, you know, it's a little bit different than what I've done in the past. But again, looking for alternative investing and there's just so many things right now that my mind is getting just blown away. How many things you can do to make money from crypto to precious metals to investing in tax liens. And there's just so many things that are interesting. And I'm just so excited about this part of the journey, like learning things that they don't teach you in medical school. <laughs> so for a full-time physician, say they were listening to this episode and they typically do 401k, stock market, they want to start with alternative investments. What would be advice on what should they do and where should they start? Yeah, I think it's important to educate yourself and to learn about like what is there to do, right? What can you do? A lot of people hear alternative and they get scared. Alternative investing? No, I don't want to do that. Well, part of it is learning not to be scared and to really open your eyes. What is alternative investing? means. Alternative investing in short is just anything that's not the stock market. So it could be art, it could be NFTs, which, you know, I don't totally recommend. <laughs> it could be crypto, it could be real estate. And even within real estate, there's just so many things you can do. You can do mm -hmm. residential, you can do commercial. Within commercial, you can do a lot of different assets. Once you see that your wealth doesn't depend on the whims of the stock market, which can go up and down. There's so many possibilities. Like money is not finite. It's infinite. You can really grow your wealth as long as you change your mindset. And the only way to do that is to educate. So I would say read books, listen to podcasts, you know, listen to people and then just start absorbing information and then, you know, jump in, schedule calls, decide what you want to do and don't do what we call analysis paralysis, right? Like you want to learn about it and then take mm -hmm. action. That's the key. So we talked about your investment journey so far. So what's outside of real estate and investment? What other things do you do? Do you have anything outside of like hobbies or something you're passionate about outside of real estate? Yeah. So I am super excited. I am going to be going to Zambia on a medical mission trip in September. Great. It is a group of surgeons that do surgeries twice a year there. They've been doing it for 30 years. So I'm really excited about being able to 
go do that and really make an impact. What I want to do is make an impact, help people feel good. Because, you know, what is it about this life if it's not to make an impact? I'm not really into buying things like cars and clothes and label, but I love making an impact and I love travel. And my family and I are planning on going to Thailand over Christmas break as well. So I'm super excited about that. Just really living moment to moment and being present, I think is super important. And again, thinking about the bigger picture, how can I impact others? That's really good. So you now have the flexibility in your life to do different things. So just out of curiosity, so how many hours in a week do you work right now? What, what are your concerns work? I'm still doing a fair amount of work, you know, I'm doing, you know, thir between 30 and 40 hours of work, whether it's educating myself on the next, you know, type of investing. I mean, I'm spending now at least 30 hours over the last couple of weeks, just learning about tax lien investing, you know, just oh. an example. <laughs> That takes time. Mm -hmm. uh, asset managing is five to 10 hours a week, depending on what state the property is in. So there's a lot of different things that we're doing, meeting with investors. So a lot of it is still taking up my time. It's just not in a shift at the hospital. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not working overnight or I'm not working Christmas or whatever it is. I, I set my own hours. I love what I do and it doesn't feel like work. Great. So how can anyone who's listening to this podcast, they want to get in touch with you, what is the best way for them to do that? Yeah. So, I mean, there's a lot of different ways to get in touch with me, whether it's on Facebook or Instagram or LinkedIn, but the best way is just to email me, Ronnie, R-O-N-N-I-E at Shalwin Properties, S-H-A-L-W-I-N Properties.com. Email me we can set up a call. You have questions. You want a copy of a book about oil and gas. I can provide that. But yeah, I'm everywhere. You can go also check out my website. It's shallwinproperties.com. That's great, Ronnie. So one thing I wanted to also tell our viewers is I have my own website. It's called PassiveInvestingChecklist.com, which we recently opened. So if you are investing passively in some mainly multifamily syndication, so you can go and there is an online checklist you can do or you can download the PDF document there. It goes through all the questions you need to ask your sponsor and a step-by-step -step guide for you to look at things. So because most of the time you're looking at what the returns are, but that's not the most important question you need to ask first. So you can go and find that as well. Thanks, Ronnie. It was really informative. I learned a lot about oil and gas investing and other alternative investing through this podcast. I hope our viewers learned a lot as well. So thanks for coming on. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for listening to another episode of REA Doctors. If you found value in this episode, please share it with your friends. Please subscribe to this podcast and leave a comment so that others can find us. Hope to see you in the next episode. The views and opinions expressed on this podcast do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of the REI Doctors podcast or any other organization. Any content provided by hosts, guests, or other third parties is for informational purposes only and should not be construed as an offer to buy or sell any securities or to make or consider any investment or course of action. It is not intended to substitute professional financial, legal, or tax advice. The REA Doctors Podcast does not endorse any real estate investment opportunities or strategies mentioned on the show. Please seek the advice of a qualified professional before making any investment decisions. The REA Doctors Podcast is not responsible for any errors or omissions in the information provided on the show.